Hey guys, Ben Ostervelt here with the Business From Within podcast. Interviewed by a podcast really focused on real estate investing. But the title is called The Truth About Real Estate Investing. So when I got asked to speak on this, oh, there's my phone. Thanks for the text. When I got asked to speak on this podcast, I thought, you know what? It's just going to be real. Just do my thing. Speak the truth. And that's what I did. I don't know if I got too real. Have a listen. I talk about how I got uh, 60 properties, 61 properties at one point, how we had to liquidate, how we had to sell. Uh, I've given some amazing tips on how to actually do some real estate investing. But you know what? Typical me, getting deep, getting real about real life stuff. Anyways, hopefully you enjoy. Cheers. Uh, restart. Anyways. Awesome. Okay. Let's start from, let's start from the beginning, which is uh, we've known each other forever. Yeah. I don't even know how far we go back, but probably, I don't know, like maybe, I just, I don't know when we first crossed our paths. It has to be online, right? Yeah, yeah, Cause, yeah, yeah, because we don't live, yeah. okay, so where do, where do you live? Uh, Alberta, um, in Canada, Alberta, in, what's my town here? Sherwood Park, so Edmonton. I don't even know where I live. <laughs> I think so the last 20 minutes of trying to fix my computer has just thrown me. Right, right. <laughs> so. Yeah. And we like, if I check Facebook, I think we have like 80 to 100 mutual friends. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, a estate. lot of, a lot of, yeah, via real estate. And uh, we're friends, we're both friends with a ton of Philip, friends of Philip McKernan yeah. and, and real yeah. estate investment at work. Um, Zabo. Yeah, Zabo. Zabo. Yeah, I had him on the podcast. Need to have him back soon. I know he's trying nice. to do some pretty cool stuff. He's such a nice guy, too. Brilliant yeah. guy. There's no only one, only one with that guy. He's yeah. the only one that's like him talking about mentality like I, I couldn't believe the stuff he was saying it's like oh geez Ian if, uh, I, I, I don't I think I mentioned this to him off the air afterwards like damn it Ian if you just keep telling your story people will be throwing money at you <laughs> <laughs> right yeah I know and it's and it's totally yeah he's he's especially I watch him he's about to explode so yeah he's he's going hardcore into the short bus the thing is, is that he could explore like five years ago if, if he just believed in himself um, yeah, totally. I think that's a lot of us all the same. Yeah. Like, Everyone no, like 10 those. years ago, Ian could have exploded. Like, he just didn't <laughs> I believe think he, in himself. We have evolution, though. There's timing. Like, I think it's, uh, there's timing in everything. Mm -hmm. We need to learn lessons. Yeah, it's just Once about... we learn enough lessons, and then it's, it's almost like, it's almost like, I don't want to, I want to be mega, mega successful, mega famous and all this. Like, I was thought years ago, I'm like, I know where I'm going, and it's going to be a public eye and all that. And I thought, you know, like, a lot of these people completely crack when they become famous and they mm -hmm. crack when they get that attention mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's it the characters come out like the flaws and the characters actually come out when that happens and i always thought you know what it's all good man be patient because there's a there's human development that has to happen like can like how does how does your ego play into you know you know being the top of the world can you handle that mm -hmm. so i i think when it comes to ian he's ready i think he can he can handle it mm -hmm. like i don't know if 10 years ago for me i'd be different too yeah same here so yeah. How old are you now, Ben? Uh, 37. 37. Yeah. A side, quick side note, and then we'll get into we'll get into the actual interview. Just sure. just just think about what you accomplished from the age 20 to 30. Yeah. And then what you've done from age 30 to now, and not, and for the rest of you, until you're 40. Like, yeah. Like wow, like those my 20s were like <laughs> not a waste. Like they they yeah. were required to get to me to where I am. But the productivity, the uh, the returns have been significantly better post age thirty. Uh, from yeah, knowing a bit but, about your story, I think you're along that same line. Well, I've been I've been I've been crazy high performer since twenty though. Like I okay, once, let's start let's I, start then. Okay, let's start know. start what age what 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 age should we start at? Should we start at well, age twenty? I don't know. Like I I think uh, twenty. I was just. Let's see here. I was still working at the rehab center I graduated from after 365 days in there, and so so I was I was 18 I was 17 to 18 spent 365 days in in a, in a drug alcohol treatment center. Mm -hmm. So I had my 18th birthday there, and then I, I I left around, but I came back and worked there for a few years. So mm -hmm. in that time, so early 20s I was there, but then I got into I got headhunted by a by a commercial office furnishings 
company as a sales guy. And I was like, 10 years too young for my business. Mm -hmm. I mean, 10 years too young for that industry. Like we had AutoCAD drawers, designers, they would actually do building the furniture. It's pretty high end. Mm -hmm. But I ended up, I ended up finding, a, you know, I was always good at sales. I ended up selling two and a half million dollars of office furniture. Mm -hmm. But here's the crazy thing. It, there's just like this kamikaze. This is the 20s. It's kamikaze. Like, mm -hmm. and it's like now I have five kids and I'm like, I know the difference. Um, uh, like, it's funny, I analyze risk differently. It's almost like when you're, those years, it's like, who fucking cares? Because yeah. it's like, so I, I no quit more my money job. Than, after than they know what to do two with. and a half years in the business, I quit quit selling office furniture. I'm going to be a real estate investor. And I just went for the money and I bought like 41 properties in 14 months and just went absolutely crazy building a real estate investment company. But so okay. that was my 20s. I was, I was just absolutely blindly driven. Okay, before, like, let's go back. It's kind, sure. of, it's kind of like that Seinfeld episode, like how Elaine yada, 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 sex, but that's not this case. You kind of like, you almost, you didn't quite <laughs> yeah, say yada, yeah, yada, yeah. yada, yada, but you almost like yada, 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 the whole rehab. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of years, a lot of stories in there. <laughs> how did you, what, did, what caused you to end up in rehab? Jeez, uh, just, you know what, growing up, I guess I feel like as a kid, I, if you're doing a poker analogy, I got dealt the two and a seven mm -hmm. and I had to try to win the game that way. And I didn't have any, like I had a, yeah, like home life was just, my dad was just a, he was a really good guy, but totally broken from his own father, like the generational patterns, mm -hmm. just to understand that like as a kid, I didn't feel loved and valued and uh, yeah, I couldn't figure it out. And it was very traumatic the way I was living, was like super loved. And then like almost like a bipolar relationship with, my dad, I don't know if what he has. Like, I just actually went out with for coffee with him today, and we have a we have a fairly fairly good relationship, and we're mm -hmm. still building on it. But it, yeah, like I lived on the streets when I was like, I I took off when I was twelve years old. I I literally had this weird, yeah. I was I had this old thought. It was like there's an old soul, whatever that means. I don't even know what that means, but it felt like I'm sitting there, and I'm just maybe it's just my intelligence or something. I'm just like, if I stay here, I'm gonna be like my dad. I'm gonna be like these guys. And I knew from the core, I'm like, I'm not like this. I'm a real good dude. And I feel like if I keep staying in this pattern, I'm going to be them. So at 12, I stole some money from my dad. He used to preach at an old folks home and all their offerings to God. I took those and uh, I, I called the cab and the, I lied to the cab and says, yeah, you know what? I'm going to, uh, I'm just meeting my friend. My dad gave me some money. I don't know what the cabbie was thinking, 12 year old kid, but he took me into town and I started running away from home. So it was a series of running away from home and then until finally I uh, like it was pretty angry and troublesome at that time, but ended up getting kicked out. My parents didn't welcome me back. So 14, 15, 16, I had to figure out how to live, had to live on the streets and I was pretty innovative. I was, but what's interesting is that the residue left from that is that it's hard not to look at relationships from a survival mentality. And this is something new I've just started to learn now. It's like, how do I position myself with relationships? And it's like you position yourself not to be stolen against. You position yourself not to be hurt. Mm -hmm. You position yourself to manipulate and leverage. Mm -hmm. And you just start looking at this honestly. And I could never look at the, this honestly now. I feel like I've got self-awareness and authenticity for real. But it's like, or as much as I can at this point in my life. But I feel like that residue is like you meet people and there's this, this the tie to the story. I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah, like living is a survivor. And how is that affecting me today? So anyway, that's like current, current news for me right now. Just looking at how does the survival of a child as a teen affect my relationships with my wife, kids, business, uh, real estate, yeah. you know, mentoring people like the survival instinct shows up and it can come across as manipulative. Yeah. It can come across as, as um, maneuvering people to do what they want yeah. or not letting them totally in because it's not safe. So I think there's a lot of people like, like it's so amazing how your story actually affects your business. I'm obsessed with that. I'm obsessed with it. So anyways, I'm kind of going way off into a rabbit hole here. But so you asked me one question, you're like, well, why the heck do you get into rehab? So, well, the story is pretty, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. I, uh, one night I was on out of mushrooms, cocaine, I was drinking, mm -hmm. I had rented a basement suite. Mm -hmm. I always made money. That's one thing I always made money even back in the day. And, and one day I was just so high and I was hallucinating and, something just pulled on my heart and says go home it was the craziest thing so i don't know if it was the drugs or if it was some spiritual guidance but i i called the cab cabbed it back to my parents house it was like three in the morning i was i barely remember getting there 
I'm standing at the door, knocking on the door. And my mom come down. My mom came downstairs and she goes, "What are you doing here?" And she's a mom, right? So she's she's always that's that's her boy. And I think my dad had given up on me. He's rejected me at this point. He didn't even come to see me. He just stayed in bed. And I sat on the stair. I threw about a thousand dollars cash on the floor. I said, "Mom, I got I got cash. I got money." I said, "But look in my eyes. I'm really high right now." And I said, "I'm empty. I'm so empty." and uh, broken. I said, to be honest, I'm, I just don't want to die. I'm, I, it's my plan. I'm going to die. And uh, she says, there's a place called Teen Challenge. And there's like this, it's a hyper Christian, one of the largest nonprofits in the world. And it's, it's, uh, I went to this ranch. I, I thought, I'm going to do this one time. I'm going to give it one chance. And if I can, if I can find wholeness, and I said, I'll give it everything. Like, I'm not going to mess around. If this is going to help me, I'm going to give it because I want to live, right? So yeah, and I went to this program. And it was totally weird. We wake up in the morning. You got to do dishes. You got to you got to do devotions. You got to study. You got to do work detail. It's like jail for 365 days, self-inflicted. You had to work at a store for free. Then you got to make dinner. And then you got to clean up. Then you got to do devotions. You got to like it's just it was just like this 365 days of rehab, but it was very more spiritual essence versus just tactical stuff. I think there's definitely pros and cons to to that. And that that was my start of my turn. So when I turned 18, I. I felt like okay, it, it actually worked. It was a, it was definitely right. a start of something. So, anyways, that's <laughs> so, so that's not not about real estate or anything, but that's how that's that's kind of a bit of an origin story there. Looking back, what was it that helped about it? Was the, it being clean? Being in the program? Yeah. I don't know. I think um, I think deep down, I was just a, I was just a little boy hurting. So my story is that I just would want it, I just wanted to die so depressed and angry and I don't I don't know exactly I think I wanted it so bad yeah. to be normal mm -hmm. and I the one thing was missing they didn't teach self value and they taught like your values in God and stuff and I feel like there's a big miss because I find like my wholeness comes from finding myself having value and that wasn't taught in that so mm -hmm. that's something I'm in the later years. To be honest, I don't know what what it worked. I think going away for for a whole year was huge. And obviously, I like they they taught about all everything was like a, almost Christian. It was and so was it a God thing? Was it was it real? Probably. Uh, do I know anything about that too much? Not really, not really. But so, so I don't know. I think I found stability. I found some routine. Mm -hmm. But then it was afterwards. I had to figure it out. I had a good chance at it. I feel like I'm a lucky guy, man. Lucky guy. A lot of my friends don't make it. They still, I, I saw one guy the other day, just by chance, ran into this guy. He's got missing teeth. Looks like a big bag of shit. Just the worst looking. He looks at, hey, Ben, how you doing, man? I'm like, oh. And I don't know what my face was like, so I'm like, holy shit. Like, that could have been me. Yeah. And I just have just unreal compassion for this. And just seeing it. So what worked? I don't know, man. I don't know. It's hard to answer. Like, there's no silver bullet. It's almost beat the odds, really. Thinking back, what would you have told twelve or twelve year old yourself? Say you say you're the dad, and yeah. your kid is twelve year old Ben. What do you what do you tell him? What what does he need? What is he missing that you that needs that he needs to be taught? I think I think at that point at twelve, it, it'd be a very difficult conversation with me at that point. Even eight, four. I think he'd have to go. He'd have to go back <laughs> a bit. Um, yeah, I just I, if I was the dad to me, I would I, I would know how to love him. I would know exactly what to give him. Mm. Like he would feel valuable. I would show him. I'd show him how who he was. I would treat him with respect. I would. I would let him have whatever belief and whatever voice he has. And I would also encourage him to break the rules. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I would. I. I. When it comes to kids, they're so like. Uh, like they're so stuck in the fucking rules. Like make sure you go to school. Make sure you follow the grades. Keep up to the standards. Make, mm -hmm. This is what you believe. Whether it's religion. Whether it's. Whether it's politics. Whether it's a, like. I want, I would just say, believe whatever you want and I have your back. Mm -hmm. I truly will have your back. I will always accept you. Do whatever you want in your life. And I'd love to see you break the rules and be a pioneer. And if, if you want to follow a certain path, I got your back. And it would just always feel safe with me. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's, it's just, that's what it is. I've actually done a lot of that inner work from speaking to my own little child. So I, I have uh, some extremely powerful experiences like that, that I've gone through. So I, my first time I ever talked about that, that was pretty amazing. So, but I, I just, I would just love them. So I, I know how to do that now that I have kids, right? Mm -hmm. So, so my, my, my mini me would be very loved and accepted and valued. 
it would be allowed to do whatever he wants. I wouldn't put him in a direction that he needs to go. And I think that's the biggest mistake parents make. I say, well, you need to do this. If you don't have, if you don't get your work ethic, mm-hmm. or you better have a trade to back you up if this thing doesn't work, or mm-hmm. you need a degree. And mm-hmm. in our family, that there would, that there is F that. That is not how to raise a child. So that's obviously I got some energy around that. But yeah, yeah. I, I think our parents just did the best with it, with what they did could. Uh, is I think yeah. the first objective of any parent is to. Uh, do better than their parents did. So for for some, you know, you know, I was talking, I was talking to my friend Michael Liano, who, who's going to on vacation in Sault Ste. Marie, which is way the hell north. And how he's saying how his parents are Italian. Obviously, they don't have internet. Those are his words. <laughs> right? They're it's Italian cool immigrants. System, yeah. Obviously, they don't have internet. Like that's what he's coming. That's his upbringing, his right? Yeah. So what can they teach you about that whole world of digital marketing, whatever? <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah just just do better than what your parents did and that's that's a that's a good first yeah. step yeah absolutely yeah exactly and my dad did because it was way 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 less worse than what he went through and mm-hmm. he's got a good soul he just doesn't have as much balls as i do to face the reality of who i really am mm-hmm. which is challenging everything even your faith mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so so yeah you did some investing i wrote down 41 properties in 14 months what drove that? Well, that's again, it comes back to your story when you're not loved and respected. And yeah. one thing you find is when people, people give you a positive, like I've had a lot of negative reactions to life. And then when someone's like positively, like this is like, we're talking years of therapy here. This isn't just self discovery overnight. Like we're talking like, you want the deep question or the, the, the real question. I mean, sort of the surface or the real, and the real is that just driven to make my dad happy or prove. And if he's not going to be happy, well, it's just ironic that he was an invest. He was a financial planner, and I just look back and go, I wonder how much I subconsciously was like, you know what? I'll beat him at his own game. And and honestly, it wasn't there like that. Like I know now that wow, I wonder if that's deep down what was going on, mm-hmm. because and what is really motivating me was first of all, I want to be number one, and that was a real curse I've had most most of my life, and I and I always would hit it, but there was always a price to pay for being number one. Mm-hmm. This is one of the biggest lessons I've ever learned. To be honest, I, I was number I became number one very quickly in the selling office furniture. I sold chocolate bars as a kid, dominated. Every single place I would, there was only with the self-acceptance was only number one or you're nothing. And so that was a that drove me hard. And so and money was a real representation of success. So I would just say, okay, great, I'm gonna go after as much money. Dude, I had 61 properties, and I'm like, this is not enough. Like I'm looking, like I had a thousand in my mind. Not like I don't just go by number one. I go by like like it's so I feel like there's a really good thing that's left over with me. Like I can I can perform. Mm-hmm. I can do it like that other guys don't even compete with. But the thing is, uh, I'm really connected to what I really want in life. And and like that's the thing. The motivation to buy as many properties as I could was just just absolute dominance. I just wanted to be number one and just I couldn't accept myself unless I was the highest. And there's always a higher goal and always a higher goal and I was just mm-hmm. chasing them. Just chasing it. So what happened to the portfolio? What year was that? What year did uh, you? Geez, two, I started investing two thousand five, six, seven, on a small, small scale. When I when I really jumped in, it was t- I don't even know two thousand six. I think was really when I said, "Okay, I, I quit my job." Like I just can't imagine. Like I just quit it. Like, I'm like, "Okay, don't worry, I'll do it. I'll get, I'll figure it out." Like just absolute entrepreneur. But it's a little bit unwise to be honest. But I I did and. Um, I had four different cities. I had just, it was so much. I had people working for me, but, um, yeah, it was really great. And then, and then 2008, nine, 10. So 2008 was half decent still, but once you started, what was it? 2008 June. And that's when like, it was almost hard and anyone can like the shame that I've had to carry, but I've, I've, I've let it go because you're investing people's money. And when things are really, really good, fuck, you're a genius. Yeah. The best thing to describe my company was when the water went out, you see who's swimming naked, Warren Buffett's quote. And in one level, I had a lot of really good stuff, like everything cash flowed. It wasn't buying stupid stuff like that. But then it started, then we started like buying, we bought this one, like there's, we started picking off developers that were going to go under. So these are condo converters. So what happened was they got greedy too. So what they did was they flipped one. They're like, wow, made like $3 million. 
let's do five more. What are we doing? Bam, bam, bam. And then the crash hit. And I know some of these developers. I come on with my group of investors. I said, here's the deal. I'll buy 20 right now. But this is how the deal is going to go. And we structured the deal to be, it was the most craziest winning deal. Easy to sell. My investors got their places fully rentaled. I got them rentaled. And we got, um, we, I won't go into the deep structure of the whole thing, but but the thing is, there's a lot of money that we're that we were making on buying them and holding them, and I was 50/50 on all of them, and so we were picking up stuff 50, 60, 70 grand under value, which we thought were geniuses. There's one project that still is underwater because they were the the prices were boomed in condos here, and it's like it's it's now come back, and that's how long it's taken. The specifically, there was one project that was I think we we're buying them at like 250, and they were appraised at 300. And we're sitting there going, guys, this is 50 grand under. They all cash flow. So I picked up 10 of them. Mm-hmm. The crash happens a year later. Those are the ones that got hit the hardest. Now, I think I just sold one uh, uh, 220. We're talking 10 years later, right? And so, so, so that, like, I'm t- early 20s, high performer, super insecure, haven't done a lot of personal work to, that, to the level I've done now. The, the intensity of having people come to you that they have problems in their finances because of the crash and they come to you and say, I want my money. And I say, I can't give it to you. Like, just like, I think I can handle it now. I'd be like, dude, you made the call. Like, I'd be like, you made the call, you knew the risk. You know, we got to work this out, but we're in to get like, now I was like, oh my goodness. Like I just, as an early investor, just couldn't mm-hmm. handle so many people mad at the process. And honestly, like I've talked to lots of them now and it's like, it was situational, right? Like the investments were good. It's not like we were buying junk. No one was ripped off. Everything was locked really good. Yeah. But the process of having 25 investors during a crash was so like, and then I, then my weak points in my company started showing. We were heavy on the marketing, heavy on the sales, getting deals together. We had great joint venture documentation and everything. But then it came to like bookkeeping, reporting, started looking at that going, oh, geez. So it cost me literally, literally tens of thousands of dollars to try to figure out how to you know, during that process, it wasn't done. I hired the wrong girl. She had no clue. I'm a young businessman, put the wrong person in place thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll just trust her, mm-hmm. which is a big mistake. Yeah. And then I also had a, I brought a partner in. I won't go into the details of that. But the thing is, I eventually fired this lady. And I'm and, and this this process of like learning how to do business was probably the most learning. Like, I, I feel lucky that I've gone through that pain. There was days I was sitting there, like one guy just calls me and goes, hey, Ben, I want you to give me my property back because, and he knew a couple points that I was trying to like avoid securities and different, different things. I didn't have anything to worry about, but it was in my head because I had created investments that were potentially questionable if it was a security, as you probably know, the JV is odd. And so I paid $10,000 to get my joint venture, probably similar joint venture you use. Um, if, as I got it reviewed and the determination from the law law firm that I paid 10 grand for was it's, if there's no guarantee that this is not a security because you're an expert and you're running the show. They don't, they're not experts. You're taking their money. You're bringing an investment. It literally looks like a security, but it's not. And so, so this is something I got really scared of being a young businessman. I didn't have good mentorship around me and the, and the, and the, the, the crash was happening. I had a guy call me, goes, and, and, and my, my ex partner knew that secret in my heart that I was like, Oh man, if I all oh, like it was all crashing around me and I'm just like the securities, oh man, if they came at me, now what do I say? I just spent ten grand to check if it's right. I spent ten thousand dollars just to see if it's right. And they couldn't they said, you know what? And we don't know. Like it's it looks a security pop. We just can't guarantee one way or the other. I'm like, oh thanks. So I thought if I ever got like now you get into that what if happens. So now I'm scared. I don't know what's going on. The world's falling apart. Like I've got all this property and all these demands and no one's investing anymore. Now that's that's where the income was coming in. We're bringing in investments. We'd always take some money through the investment, and it was really cool setup until this happened. And that one guy blackmailed me. He calls me, "Hey, I'm going to go to securities with you, Ben." Goes right at me. I'm like, "How the hell do you even know this?" And it, I found out it was a really good friend of my ex partner. And they said, "This is how you're going to get your property." This was my one of my best best properties, 1,300 square foot with basement, four level splits in an area of Edmonton that was just gold, and I stole it. We were making, I don't know, 2,000 bucks a month on cash flow. And it was just, we renovated all of them. At the end of the day, I, I called my lawyer because I, I recorded the call. The guy blackmailing me and he's like, well, I can't use the call, but you have two options. You can fight him 
or you can let him have it. And at the point, at the time, I just, I, I think he paid me four grand for some expenses and I walked. So those are like, like, those are moves that are like, those are life changing moves. I remember sitting at my desk, crying my eyes out, just not knowing what to do. And, and the thing is now, if I went through that whole process now or today, I would have pulled it all off. No problem. But when you're, when you're, when you have all, it's so fast, you grew so fast mm -hmm. and it was so easy mm -hmm. and no experience at all in dealing with this type of thing, which even the best of them, there's people that killed themselves, man, over the crash. Yep. And I'm trying to navigate this thing and I'm on my own and I'm insecure. I just want to make people happy. It's like my story just haunted me with how I managed the mm -hmm. process. So now today I have about, what do I got now? I was at, when I left that, I ended up with 10 of my own. I had 10 properties of my own. I'm down to seven or no, eight of my own now. And uh, yeah, I'm renovating one up in uh, Hinton. You know, I'm putting another five, seven grad into it. These are good properties. Looking at the pay down now, I'm like, this is awesome, man. Like we're paying these things down, mm -hmm. get cash flow. I still got two dogs in my portfolio. They're just dogs and it cost me hundred bucks a month. Can't, can't do nothing about it. We, we bought them and just crashed. And the, that was right at the peak. So most people that are have invested have awesome ones and have a couple that are challenging. I can't sell them. So we just keep renting it. I take a loss on my portfolio is winning though. I got a good portfolio, but it's, those are two dogs. So yeah, it was a very, very challenging process. So I had sold, I sold some properties back to a lot of my investors. I gave them great deals. Went, I met with every single one of my investors face to face, told them what's going on. I said, guys, I can have to make a change. This is something that's happening. Sat down with them. I showed them all their financials and everything. I said, look, here's what the thing's worth. I'll give you a discount. Buy me up for this much. You take over, you get hundred percent of the equity. And I walked and I did that to every single investor. Right. And there was a couple that were more like probably only like two or three were like hyper aggressive because their own financial mutual fund portfolio was just screwed. And they were thinking the real estate was going to save them. And it was, it was also stuck, you know, nothing was selling. So I had two or three, I liquidated a couple like, and the rest I sold. So by the way, I've never shared the inner story of that my entire life. Just, you know, or how it actually went down. People just see, oh, wow, we had lots of real estate investment. Wow. That's the cool thing about the podcast is to, you know, when do you have like an hour to talk about yourself? I think about that. When's the last time you had an hour to talk about yourself? Yeah, I probably talk about myself, but, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> no, but yeah, no, like, yeah, for sure. When you interview and you kind of break it down and, uh -huh. and it, podcasts are cool because we don't realize we're putting this out there. It just me and you hanging out. So that's what, that's my favorite thing about podcasting. Is when you're talking to people, it's like, it's a, just look at them, right? And you don't even know. It looks like me and you're just having a chat. I'm like, oh, yeah, we're recording this, and millions of people will be seeing this. Great. You know what I mean? I don't but know about millions. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's what we're shooting for, right? Million? No. So go back to the go back to the, the, the securities partner guy. What would you have done differently today? Well, I'd tell him to go ahead and call him. Bring it on, buddy. Mm -hmm. and, he'd, and then he would have been shut down. He was bullying me. And so uh, being bullied in school just brought back all my story. And how do you deal with that? I don't know. Now I can. I'd be confident. I would be like, hey, here's the story, man. We're in this together. We've got a fantastic investment. There's absolutely no reason for you to be bought out. I'm keeping this thing. And we're going to run it together. And then I would have ran it. But I was so in like just lost under this pressure without mm -hmm. mentorship, without guidance and just no clue. And I built this thing so freaking big in my twenties, mm -hmm. like how many millions of dollars of real estate have and like, and I'm managing it. And it's like, then you get into this world of doubting yourself. And I just wouldn't doubt myself. I just, that's the one thing that's cost me more money in my life than ever is just doubting myself. How'd you get over it? <laughs> you have enough pain and lessons and I'm at 150% committed to getting through shit in my life. So I, I don't care if people see me buck naked, totally embarrassed. If it gets me over something, I'll fucking do it. Like, I, I don't care. Like, that's one thing about me is I'll I ask, like, I'll just do whatever. Like, I've got more, I don't mean to Gary Vee and brag about myself and be like, I got more, I got more balls than the average guy when it comes to personal growth. Mm -hmm. I'll do whatever it takes. And you come like, a long way. So I, you've come a long way and I want, I want our, our listeners to understand that. So, like, I know people don't like the bragging about themselves, but I invite you to tell us what you've accomplished. Because mm. I, I uh, like again, we've been we've been Facebook buddies forever, and I see I see all okay. the stuff that you've gotten, uh, all yeah. the awards you've collected. Could you can you name off some of them? 
Yeah, there's two worlds, right? There's the there's the public world, and yeah. then there's the vet, what really is important yeah. to me. Yeah. Which so the words are not really important to me. They actually don't mean very much. But I've, you know, I I don't know. I I was I started a co- I started uh, like I was a business coach. Uh, after that, I redeveloped my life, and I went into uh, I coached energy companies. I coached videographers, like, and I just coached everyone. And it was kind of a finding my group. I'm like, this is pretty cool. Like when you coach out of your when you've gone through something, you've overcome. There's something cool about helping someone overcome the same thing mm-hmm. or something similar. Through this journey of self-development, I've, I've learned one of the biggest things I've ever accomplished is I can read people really well. I, but it's not just like, like I sure, I can read someone in and out, but there's a soul part of it that's just absolutely cool once you become, like I'm not arrived, man. Don't ever think I've ever arrived. I, I've got so much. I've got my insecurities. I've got my stuff I still work on too. But the reality is I can see people for who they really are. That is the biggest thing that I've ever, the biggest accomplishment is I can look at someone and I'm like, hey, here's how we, if I can just help them, if they let me, if they let me and I can see who they are and I can help them believe in themselves and I can show them who they are, how to get over it because I had so much dysfunction. Mm-hmm. But that's a side thing. The mm-hmm. thing is though, I've, I, I joined as a, I became a real estate agent. I asked 12 realtors if I could coach them and they all agreed. So I, I can, I don't know how I convinced them. I got 12 real estate agents. I started a, a real estate launch program. And I had, and I had not never launched as a real estate agent. I said, "Well, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to launch, and you're going to see it live happen." And they obviously believe in me, and uh, they, and I, and I did. I met once a week at the real estate board, and I rented a room, had 12 people, and uh, some of them today are still way on top of their game. Most of them got impacted in forever through that course. But I started, and I became. So my, so I, I had a few months before my, I got my, I don't know, made 50 grand from like September to December. But then my first calendar year, I made four hundred and forty thousand dollars in commissions and became easily rookie of the year for the whole area. And then the next year, I made six hundred and sixty thousand. I made over a million dollars my first two calendar years as a real estate agent, and it was very easy. The only thing is, it would take a lot of hustle, a lot of work, and commitment. And during that process, like I've made millions of dollars. I've only been a real estate agent for about five years now, and uh, now I have a team of four working for me. I've created a team model that is absolutely not heard of. Um, we can go into the details of that if you really want. But that 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 model is just absolutely working. It's based on human human development, mentorship, uh, sales, marketing. But but it's um, the people that come on my team. I'm not hunting for them. I give them a piece of my commissions if they bring on someone that we can work with that is really fit. Our culture is absolutely number one. And the culture is world class client experience, and we brag about the world class client experience. We never brag about commissions. There's a whole bunch of cultural things in there that we've, we've developed a system and as a team that. That is that is um, like it's working. It is working so good, but it is the right personnel. So um, yeah, and I and 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 uh, built a national real estate uh, coaching program, and I I've just, I, I know I've been being paid pretty good money to be speaking at, on stage. So I got a bit of a speaking business running, uh, but mentoring real estate agents, and it's not even real estate agents. It's just people. Real estate was just strategy, just to get to people. To be honest. Mm-hmm. My talent is sales and marketing, but uh, oh, awesome! They got a, like a serious muscle curl, so I just revving it up. Could you hear that? Yeah. Nice. So that's my gut. I'm hungry. Anyways, so you know, with with the um, no, like I, I like I've I don't know Titan Award for Remax is always just on, it's eight out of what is it over eight hundred thousand. Uh, like it's consistently consistently we're probably gonna break a million dollars this year, and I'm honestly barely selling. I'm not about I'm hoping to do like 30% of all the sales and then next year, 2019, I won't be selling at all and I'll be moving into more of a personal growth angle. So the, all I can say is that uh, the successes, I got lots of awards for real estate. They don't mean much to me. Uh, the biggest, the, the thing that this, this is the thing, I know I'm kind of just kind of jumping around here, but during the process of me winning all these awards and, and hitting these high marks, again, it's stuff that I just do. Like if I want to go number one, I do. And it's just like, you just figure it out. The thing is, though, during that process of going after it so hard as a real estate agent and a coach at the exact same time, running retreats, like the stuff that I can do is just unreal, the amount of stuff I can get done. The thing is, though, by doing that and I going after number one, my wife and I almost got a divorce during this time. A couple years ago, we she just sat down one day and says, she says, I think I'm done. And I'm, I started crying. I said, are you kidding me? This I'm doing it all for you. I'm doing it all for you. And she's like, Ben, I've been following you around through this journey, and I've got your back this whole time. And she says, but I can't keep doing this anymore. So that's the thing. When I'm popular, everyone thinks I'm amazing. This is what's happening behind the scenes. Yep. 
And I love sharing that. I actually don't like sharing it, but I love sharing it for one reason, because it, let's not put people on pedestals. Don't fucking put anyone on a pedestal. The shit that's going on behind the scenes is just the same shit you're facing. They're just really good at the persona thing. And I'd rather break that mold. If you don't like me for who I am, F it. I can't live that way, man. And so so I took I took a couple of years, did sales, just did a basic coaching program, and I worked on my marriage. And we hired a relationship coach, Kelsey Grant, who I'm doing a lot of live coaching with now on my podcast. And so we, we we're doing that. My like the healing that my wife and I went through, the understanding how men and women work, understanding like what she really needs, and and was I really doing it for my family? That's a really good question. I don't think I think I was like I'm a really good dude that way, but I was doing it for me. What was I chasing? And she just was following me around, but her her issue was that she didn't speak up the way she needed to speak up, mm -hmm. and so that was her stuff she had to work on. And all of a sudden she had a voice I'm like, "What the frick's this?" Like it's like you want that, but you don't want it. So. Yeah. I just really want to paint the picture that, like I had, I had mega success on on everything I do. But there's a story that if that other story doesn't align with that, I think it's a waste. Like if you don't have a good family, like what's the what's your day like when your wife's really angry at you, or or yeah, that's just you have this fight. You're just not jiving. Mm -hmm. You're not getting the. Am I giving my wife what she needs? Is she giving me what I need? Like is there this? Is there a communion happening? Do my kids really excited to see me when I get home? Truly, am am I like that? Is like without that what's a million bucks it's like i'd give it up in a stick like, gone i don't care you know how's your day like when that sucks you know nothing really matters nothing grooves it's like unless you don't want life and kids then you shouldn't have had that but if you know what i mean when your personal relationships are sucking business doesn't feel so good mm -hmm. it's pretty cool it's pretty deep thank you for sharing where do we go what year was this and I've, I've explained this to my team as well. So both you and I, we both have teams and I've explained this to my team yeah. as well. And, I, and actually I'll make them listen to this because I've mentioned to all of them, divorce rate in, in the real estate industry is actually pretty high from what I can see. Oh, totally. Uh, among my investment clients, I, I see, I don't know if it's, it's, it's apparent because I see it. Uh, I don't know yeah. how it compares to the population, but uh, among agents, I uh, definitely see it. Uh, people think this the business business is easy. We make lots of money. They don't understand. We give no. a lot of evenings and weekends to make this happen. Uh, yeah, that's a huge commitment. And and the truth is, if you really want to get going real estate, get ready. You got to commit to the insane amount of pressure and real estate push for a year or two. And you got to do the right things, or yeah. else you're going to constantly need to restart. Mm -hmm. This is like the this is the one reason why I'm motivated to help real estate agents, is because 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 the restart sucks. How many guys have I like right now? It's like if you can just get to the referral base, if you can get to the place and that's world-class client experience, you blow their mind, you take care of them, you, you, you have to make them absolute raving fans. And there's mm -hmm. many ways to do that. Instead of saying, how do we prospect? I wanna say, how do we blow their mind so their head pops off, they go to their friends and say, fire that realtor and hire Ben. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. because then it's focused on client experience. The, the, the Remax, the roll the page, the entire industry is built to say, how much money are you making compared to me? The entire celebration of a fucking award is how much money you made compared to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, where is the, let's celebrate how many times you got shouted out on Facebook, Instagram, that you're an amazing agent. Mm -hmm. What if our focus was to create that conversation behind our backs? Like, this is where we're obsessed. This is the secret. You want to dominate the real estate business? Mm -hmm. Red carpets, gifts, personalized, like, like obviously world-class service. You know, I don't even think you need to be that smart as a real estate agent. I don't even think you need data. Like, people are they're so heavy on data. When you walk in there, you're a data guy, but oh, they'll like me better, so they'll take me. Like, and self-awareness is one of the biggest competitive edges you can have in business mm -hmm. because you walk in, and you see what they need. Mm -hmm. They see those like the personal languages they speak. If you could kind of communicate in a language that they understand, not changing who you are, but just learning just how to do that. Mm -hmm. I get so I get so fired up in this industry because this industry is annoying. It's it's super annoying because there's such amazing agents in a system that's archaic, where they're celebrating how much money you make every month, and we're gonna post it everywhere. And you're number four. Well, no one knows it's because, oh, he made money and I didn't. Yeah. Like, just this whole thing just irks me. I don't yeah. know if it's me, if it's tied to my story. How do you feel about that? 
Like, do you I've, see that, or am I just? I'm, I'm gonna use it a little more extreme, but I'll I'll, sh- I'll start with an example. Uh, you see it all the time, like at, like bench ads and bus stop ads, like number one for whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Like, what does that mean to the customer? Exactly. To me, it looks to me you're just bragging. You're a volume person. Like, what's in it for the customer? You've completely forgotten about that. <laughs> it, the whole industry. Is not about that's a whole industry is about promoting your face, yeah. getting as much exposure as you can, yeah. and they spend all their money, mindset, everything on that. Yeah. And when it comes down to the experience you give your clients, like if I sat down and did a consultation with a team or a with a with a with a mortgage with a, with even a, a a broker or even just an agent, for I'm just a look at your experience you're giving. Mm-hmm. Let's find out. Let's find out what experience you're giving and how do we raise that bar. Mm-hmm. That's, can, it's you know. Can you go? Tell us about the red carpet and the gifts, because I've seen the red carpet. I, I, I'm you sure there's what? not some people on this podcast who who aren't familiar with your stuff. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No, go, so go when... into some of the stuff that you that you blow people's minds with, because even so even though we're yeah. talking about agent stuff, I think some of this can be applied to people who are trying to raise capital, for example, huge, or man, or huge. in business in general, just to attract clients. What I clients. what I the fundamentals of what I teach has nothing to do with real estate. Mm-hmm. It's with human connection. It truly is a how do you connect to the human, how do you leave a mark. And how do you like? And that's where sales, marketing, can, and communication comes in. It can be everywhere. So it's blow your mind. No, like let's like for example, if you go to let's just say you go to uh, buy a suit. Like let's go see. Like I would say, okay, if it was me selling you a suit, and I'm a suit salesman, I go, how could I get you to walk out of that door with your mind blown and the conversation to the point where you almost want to stop a guy in the mall and say how you got go talk to this ben guy are you in a suit i would create that so my question is we start from that let's go see is that happening well how do we create that Mm -hmm. in whatever thing whatever business you do even in your podcast i can't tell everyone what i'm doing behind the scenes because it's secret Mm -hmm. but on my podcast like there's some really really my goal is that every guest says that that the conversation around my podcast is like holy shit well, oh man, did you see what Ben did when he when he put me on the podcast? Oh my goodness! Like, like I'm I'm just constantly thinking. So yes, it goes across the board on any business there is. So in real estate, I said, how can we like? First of all, it has to not be just tactics. Okay, don't get me ever wrong. I'm not a, just a tactics guy. I'm more of a heart guy than you can ever imagine. The like, tears come, like emotions come. As you see, I'm pretty intense. But the thing is, by the way, I can't help that. Anyways, the thing is though, I thought, what's it like? to get like the experience, like what's it like to get a house? Like you just gotta connect to that experience emotionally, which is very challenging for some people, like to get a house, the, the stress, the process, like, wow. And then it's like, yeah, here's your keys. Or in your area, hey, the keys are at your lawyer's office. Like that's like, what? When I was doing a workshop in Toronto, I was like, you guys know what I mean? You go pick up the keys and you, what? Like you in your area, man, has the biggest advantage ever like you'll see uh justin mcclintock we got like there's a few different guys up coach you'll start seeing the red carpet and now guess what massive advantage the red carpet is this if you get there you roll out a red carpet i got two metal stanchions i've got a velvet rope and we put the sold slider on there and i'm sitting in my car and i want to see the reaction just because it's fun here it comes here it comes here it comes yeah they're like what the fuck this is amazing we got champagne we toast to the thing and i've got a very highly highly customized gift because I listen to the people. So the psychology is that I listen to them. Most people aren't listened to. So as soon as you meet someone and you're showing houses or meet with them, think, what's the gift? What's the gift? What's the gift? When my guys come up to go, Ben, oh, I got a closing tomorrow. What's the gift? I said, you missed the mark. You completely missed it. Now, eventually, now they're starting going, Ben, I met this new client. I already know what I'm getting them for their closing. Now, if you want to look at law of attraction, we're already knowing it's going to be closed. So you create the energy of knowing it's already a done deal. Because you've got the gift. So there's a little bit of like law of attraction strategy as well going, oh, I, like we're already, if the deal's done, we just got to go through the process. Not like, oh, I hope they stick with me. See the energy difference? Oh, I'm going to get them a gift. So there's a lot of like energy uh, management and creation mm-hmm. and it goes into like a knowing. So if you live like you're a winner, you're going to win. You live like you're trying not to lose, you're going to lose. And so, so this is why we go... What's your gift? So the, it, like one guy, one girl says, oh, I'm showing these properties, one of my new agents. And she says, oh, it's so awesome. I already know what I'm going to get her. Like she's brand new on my team. So she's getting it, right? Oh, they mentioned a tractor seat. There was a stool with a tractor seat. They said they've been looking everywhere for them. 
Now, if she didn't have that attention to what we're all about, she would have missed it. Now I said, never mention that seat again. Never mention the tractor seat ever again in your life. You have to pretend you didn't hear it, nothing, and start looking and get one ordered. And so now guess what? When they have that tractor seat after the red carpet, what's the conversation happening? Oh man, I can't believe you remember. And that's what we wanted compound. And we have three or four different strategies for aftercare that keeps that conversation going birthdays we send a magnet of their picture of themselves in front of their house with the red carpet in the next quarter so then you don't want to picture you please don't tell me actually don't tell me if you do but do not put your picture on a fridge magnet it just it just it's not what they want do you know what they want in their fridge a picture of themselves and then they'll say if you have a picture of yourself with them, or even just say a little sold sign or something, people are gonna know what that fridge magnet is. If you just have themselves in front of their house saying, yay, I bought a house, and you're nowhere in it, it creates a conversation around the picture. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's this? But if it has you on it, you killed the conversation. Because, oh, that's the real estate. And it's dead. So dinner I'm trying to show you the thinking around how to Blow the mind's client, blow the client's mind, so it creates an amazing conversation times ten. If you can up that, mm -hmm. then you're going to build a massive following, a good referral base. So the red carpet is just that's what it is. They get the keys, but we make a real big deal out of it. Mm -hmm. I, I was thinking of bringing like a marching band. I'm trying to up the game, man. I was thinking like if you want, like let's just imagine, just imagine. You know, think about the marketing behind it. So play with me. We get a marching band because deep down he was an old school marching band. I looked for the story. Let's imagine the guy was the drummer and he goes, oh yeah, that's my drum there. I was in a marching band. Oh no way. Did you like it? Oh man, I loved it. Okay. Just imagine that happens. It hasn't. I'm waiting for it by the way. And then what I'm going to do is talk to a school, give him a donation and say, I need you to walk down the street for his thing. Bum, 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 bum. And every single person in the street is going to come out of their house and watch a key release with a marching band. Now you tell me that you go to Instagram the crap out of that. You do that. And guess what happens? You get a sale out of that. Someone on the street's going, I want this guy. Or yeah. they're going to say, holy shit, I don't want that guy because he's bringing a marching band. But you get my point. Obvious question. What's, what's your Instagram? Instagram? Oh, it's just at Ben Osterfeld. So what's that little mark at, at Ben Osterveld? Is that what it is? I'll look yeah. it. I'll make sure I have it. My yeah. podcast is business from within, but I'm, that's, 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 that's where more the life and business mm -hmm. versus just like very, very little real estate on that one. Mm -hmm. but is that's, that, that's, sorry, that's, that's your Instagram account for the podcast? No, Ben Osterveld is a way to connect with me, but I'll, I, I also have a business from within podcast. It's just strictly a lot of the podcast stuff. Very but cool. Ben Osterveld, even Facebook's good. Ben Osterveld, I just, Instagram and Facebook's who I am, yeah. Very cool. And for anyone who's listening, like, yes, we are both real estate agents, but this can be applied to pretty much any business, including for those of you who are just looking to even raise capital. I think that's kind of what you want to have raving yeah. capital well, yeah. partners. Raise the money. Raise the money. Super easy. <laughs> super easy. Super Hear that, easy. folks? Oh, super so easy. easy. And it, Follow it's, this it's, formula. It's, yeah. <laughs> well, you probably they make it so you make it too official. Yeah, yeah. It's just people do it on like the biggest deals are done on a napkin because they like you. And they trust you. Yeah. So the, the goal is human connection. Mm -hmm. The goal is understanding yourself. You understand this confidence by understanding yourself. Yeah. You get into there. It's an energy thing for God, someone that's going to lend you money. And if you want to analytically show them why, that's going to be a brutal investor. Because you're going to analytically have to show them for every single thing they'll, they'll go the way. Yeah, yeah. Then they're going to trust your analytics. Or are they going to trust you? Mm -hmm. Very subtle, right? Because you are the analytics. So analytics are part of it. But you gotta know how to connect, truly connect. That's yeah. when you know their family. That's when you have empathy for their situations. That's there's something about understanding human connection. I do a I do a training on psychological languages. That has been one of the most powerful trainings I've ever done in my life. And that's just understanding their 16 different languages. If I'm speaking to an introvert, am I speaking to a sensing type who's a hyper detailed? Am I speaking to someone that's a logical mind where I have to be a prove my credibility or am I dealing with someone that's a feeling type who I need to connect with my values? Mm -hmm. But understanding within a one or two sentences, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then instantly they go, oh, this guy gets me. By the way, I'm raising money. By the way, I need this. By the way, I'm doing an interview to get a job. It just is the core fundamentals is how to understand yourself and how to connect to the human being. Mm -hmm. like people people spend so much time building a sales package to raise funds. Right, right. If you spent the same amount of time understanding yourself, yeah. understand how to connect with someone so they can see who you really are, people just throw money at you if you understand that. Right. And then the step before that is like building yourself. What do you mean by that? Building yourself. 
Uh, as in, so I'm not again tips and tricks, but more about yeah. believing in yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah, which is which is so cliche now. Hey, everyone wants to believe in themselves now, and it's almost become pop culture about yep, love myself, put myself first. I'm going to do yoga today, and like some of these people are not growing, but they're doing the right things. So this, it's I find that having someone challenge you, someone that you trust, challenge who you are, challenge what you do. Sometimes it's your wife, but that doesn't work very well because they see who you really are. And they're like, that's my wife's like, you're not like that. I'm like, oh, come on, I am like that. And I go, let me just fight versus thanks for the awareness. <laughs> you know. But, but I think there's this weird thing. I try to put myself in a position where it's so uncomfortable and they say, and I say, like, who do you think I am? And if someone that I trust can speak to my soul, I have blind spots and I go toward them. If there's something uncomfortable, I go toward it. If I'm something scared of, I go toward it. And then you grow. Like I think about a little bit of a, it's because you're just talking about, I just love to explain this because people are like, yeah, we need to believe in ourselves. Like, what, how does that do? Look in the mirror and say, I'm amazing. I'm amazing. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Belief is something. When It'll work for 10 minutes. Something, It'll work for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. So what is that like? Drugs. <laughs> and you're and you're always hooked on that. That's yeah. why, you, man, those people go to every single self development course out there, and they never change. Yeah. It's the drug. But but the thing is, when you've overcome something really hard in your life, you can't take that away from me. I look you in the eye. You don't know. I do. Not an arrogant thing, but it's like I've overcome that. Mm -hmm. I've overcome that. And then there's a compassion, and there's something going. Hey, do you want to see how to do that? There's something. But I I think that people they don't want to face their real truth. And I think that's a big thing. They want to, they don't want to face that reality that they're not as good as they say they are, or, or maybe they're better than they say they are. It depends on which angle. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think you got to run toward your fear, run toward the really hard conversations. We avoid, 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 and try to build stuff around it. But I've been the most dysfunctional guy I know for a mm -hmm. long time before that. Mm -hmm. There's run a, toward it. there's this, this question that Tim Ferriss always asks his guests. It's uh, if you could get a billboard, put anything you want on it, what would it be? And for myself, I'll ask you, I'll ask you what you will. Sure, put yeah. on it. For myself, I would put on it, you are more powerful than you think you are. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people have that self doubt. I see it all the time because I work with the clients as well who are trying to build more for themselves. And the real estate yeah. is one thing really in reality, they're trying to build more uh, of a lifestyle. Uh, they want more time with their kids. So they're trying to build a business so that to support that, right? That's that's what they're really looking for. But then there's so much self doubt. Totally. Right. It's so many people totally. who think that that you need special skills to do anything, like 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 you've done a lot of real estate. You know this isn't that hard, either as mm -hmm. an agent or or as an investor. It's really not that hard, especially if you're just trying to buy like one to three properties. It's kind of a joke, really. It's pretty easy, yeah. Um, Once you figure it out, yeah. Or just have good guidance. If you have good people around yeah. you, it's really, really, really easy. Yeah. <laughs> and what you yeah. think are problems are not that bad. <laughs> it's just unknown, right? You just uh, the unknown. It makes it look you just get overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, but I've, I like for example, I know people with like master's degrees. Like there'll be a couple. No, I've had a couple. I've had couples with like both PhDs and like oh, wow, I don't know how to get how to, this first property is that looks it's like yeah. Mount Everest like. Like, geez, you guys yeah. both have PhDs. This is not that yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah, so, so what you're proving is that, that the analytics and the logic do not solve the real problems in life. Mm -hmm. What it is is their emotions or fears, where is this tied to their story? Did they lose money ever before? Have they had yeah, yeah. trusted people that they didn't trust before? What are they really saying? Yeah. They're not saying anything about the investment. You got to look past that and go, what are they really saying? This is when you freaking hack those relationships in a way. Hack is such a bad word. When you When you tap into the real truth behind someone mm -hmm. and if you can speak to that all of the it becomes viral, viral or they run away mm -hmm. like, holy shit you see me bye that's good too because mm -hmm. they might lean they might think about that later mm -hmm. so when i see people i don't see their what they're offering i have a hard time with that it might be frustrating with some people but i see who they really are mm -hmm. like why so the answer is like oh it's so crazy i have a phd which which is maybe where they're hiding because they feel so stupid i don't know they're like i don't know their story but that's you can figure out how to make them, t how they tick, and you can ha just be okay and say, I accept you that way. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh, safety. Now they open up, and now you take care of them. You know, like so many, we all have that. I, I try to be who I am and be as open as I can. Like, and, and I feel like that sometimes can be quite intimidating to people. Mm -hmm. but, but it also can be very inspiring. Yeah, yeah the intimidating part for sure, because some people aren't ready to know that part of themselves. Or want sure. to share or talk about it. 
Yeah, like they just want to go, hey, I'm a like I like a like I'm a bubbly person, and that's who I am. I look at them like, oh, you're not really. Oh, you see that? Oh shit. <laughs> then that's a weird moment, right? Yeah. So it's very sensitive, and it's very you have to be very kind and compassionate, or else yeah. you look very judgmental, and it comes across wrong. Which I've done both. <laughs> yeah. And and, and to, to be fair, like some of those people, they just have shit they can't deal with, and that's the front, that's the face they put on. So, yeah, it's a survival mode for this, and it always comes back to the story. Like they haven't, they've just kind of, like it's, it's, it's always a little child in there somewhere mm-hmm. with a story. Mm-hmm. It helps me really not judge people that way. I still judge people. I try not to, but. But really, like, if you can connect to who they really are, who they really are, and they may have not disconnected from that for years. That's like the, if you had to say what I do for a living the rest of my life, I'm just going to help people be who they really are. And and if you want to know who you really are, I can help you kind of un, un, unearth that a little bit. And I can support you in believing in yourself. Pretty and then, then, then you see people's incomes double, which is so cool. It's the craziest side effect I've ever seen. Yeah, relationships double, vacations double, uh, the depth of the relationships. Some relationships just get broken up because they should never be in it. But when you start doing a self-discovery journey, like it just seems so cliche now, but what I know I've seen happen, these people's lives are changed. And that's the starting point to the success that we are chasing. But we never can get to the level of success because we have barriers in our emotional makeup, in our mentality, in our narratives. These things are just stopping you. From a very core level, I don't believe I need to be successful, but I'm going after success. Have fun. It won't work. You'll sabotage it. Mm-hmm. So that has to be looked at. Mm-hmm. That's why I feel sad when I'm like, oh, you're doing so well. And then all of a sudden it's like, you're going to hit a cap. You're going to hit a cap because this is the level of belief that you believe. Or maybe your dad said you're going to fail someday. Maybe you promise you're going to be bankrupt just like me. One one thing has to be unearthed. Figure that out. Now let's get back to being financially friggin' loaded. Like that's fine, but just work it out. So what would you have done differently before the, before the, like the 41 properties in 14 months, the 61 properties, what would you have done differently? Um, if so, I guess, could I reframe the question? Tell me if I'm hearing it right. Uh, if I was, if I was to rebuild a real estate investment company, how would I do it in versus compared to how I did? Yeah. Okay. I spent a lot of time and years thinking about this. So first of all, I would not invest in the four cities. It's the first one. Okay. Good question. Great. Great answer. and bring some tactics in, okay? Because uh, I'm, uh, I think we'll have a fair amount of depth here, and and emotional things. But tactically, I would invest in one city, and I would probably raise a lot of money for one project. Okay, so I did like 41, 61, like holy shit! The management I created, the administrative nightmare that I was dealing with at 24 hours a day. I even built my own management company, cash flow and cash flow. What I call it, cash flow property management. And and I had because I'm like they can't do it I can do it better and I could so I built a property management company I had a cleaning company I had like it was just layers upon layers of businesses it's chaos so first of all I would I would literally if I was to rebuy an investment I'd probably buy a big one and the second thing I would do is I wouldn't sell I wouldn't sell ROI mm-hmm. return on investment what I would sell is the safety of your money and the cash flow on a monthly basis that we're gonna get is higher, but you're gonna have to put a shit ton more money in. I used to talk about leverage to make the sale. If I was to redo it again, I'd say, look, uh, instead of getting you to give 100 grand, it's 250 grand, and we're gonna put 50% down. Well, that doesn't make a good investment. No, it's a very safe investment. Because when we're, we have to manage cash flow. And if you're gonna have a portfolio, and your cash is, if you can double your cash flow, but you have a lot more money in, the foundation is amazing. That you can survive. You're talking about a man that went through the darkest recession that we've ever faced in the last hundred years. And I hope, pray to God that doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. And so I would change it. I would change it a bit. I wouldn't go hyper. I was very risky. We do flips and we'd sell them before we even freaking flipped them. Like it was like, oh, this is awesome. No, no, that's ridiculously risky. So I would raise a lot of money. And, And by the way, so easy to raise money. And I'd go into a big scale. Think about one set of books for one property yeah. at a $20 million property mm-hmm. versus how many properties would that be? Let's just say 10 properties mm-hmm. that I would have to do books for. So I would look at the administrative sign of every single thing you decide to do as a business owner. Fuck, how does this, what is the admin that comes behind it? Because if you're an entrepreneur, you're most likely not admin. So you're gonna have to hire that out and you're gonna be sucky at managing it. So just make it as little and easy as possible. <laughs> So that's what I would do. And then I probably would do mixed. I would do mixed. 
I get into a mixed commercial residential potentially because then I've got the long-term anchor tenants and I've also got maybe some some other tenants but I might be more commercial driven but but I then residential but if I did residential it's mega scale because the property management companies that are 40 50 units plus are going to be 10 times the quality as a management company that deals with basic little houses because that business of property management on single family houses is completely flawed because if you look at it you're making 120 bucks per property so $1200 a month will just average whatever how many properties do you have to do to make a profit and as you grow your inventory as a property manager the ma the admin gets more expensive you're screwed there's no money in it so what do they do just fill them up easy just fill them up fill them up because the only time they're getting paid is when they're full so the whole just, and then the people they got to hire it's the worst job on the planet like it, it could be the worst job in in our in our first world issues planet yeah. is that they're uh, not living in a garbage dump there's obviously worse things but it's a terrible job to chase money and chase tenants put them in so the people are are jaded so so i would get away from anything to do with residential single family residential if i was going to rebuild mm -hmm. now if i was going to tell someone to start investing it'd be an up and down rental with a garage and try that mm -hmm. because then they got three sources of income coming in mm -hmm. You know, because that's an easy one to do. And I would probably do a legal, try to get a legal suite. If I was flipping it, I'd buy a piece of junk. I'd find an investor. I'd get them to pay the whole thing cash. Okay. Then this, then what I would do is I'd renovate it up its value, refinance it, yeah. pay this guy his money back, and maybe end up buying a property for 20 grand. But this all said and done, whatever I have to top off and I'd own it. So I'd almost get it for free. So I would just repeat that system mm -hmm. if I was doing that. Does that make sense? I moved really quickly there. To me, hopefully everyone understands that. Yeah, they can rewind think, it and listen again. Yeah, listen to it again. It's, so I'll uh, just go through it real quick. Buy the junker mm -hmm. in the best area that potentially can put a legal suite in it. I would do that, have a garage. I would I would say it's worth 300 grand. We'll just play around here. It's worth 300 grand, so I get full financing so I don't have any payments. And there'd be a balloon payment at the end to my investor. So I would have that come in. I would then, I would renovate it. I'd get the bank to look at my property that's paid off in full. I'd get a mortgage at least probably 80%. And hopefully by that time, it's maybe I can get a $375,000 mortgage because I've upped the value. So I then pay 25 grand. So I, I get this guy's money back and I got to up at 25 grand to top it off. And maybe I give him 10 or 10 grand for doing the deal. Is that better? Like maybe a little bit more explained, but that's, that's how I buy a single family. Mm-hmm. That's Very what nice. I do. But if it was raising, building an investment company where I was raising money, mm -hmm. I would not risk it. I would put in mega, I'd put way more down payment than I ever could imagine. And I'd create really good, sick cash flow coming off that thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can mitigate the risks during downturns. Very cool. I'm glad I asked the question. Uh, ben, we're running out of time. So sure. I, I feel it'd be wrong if we didn't address the question, at least, that, that, we, that started this conversation, this path on this path that got you onto this podcast. So it was a burnout. Is there, mm -hmm. is there anything you want to discuss about or ask me about it? Because that's how it's, that's how it started. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a question then. So why is that question trigger you? Why? Because oh, that's what that, that, in, that caused something to engage with me. Because that's you said that's the question that caused me to engage with you. So there's obviously a mirror happening and there's something yeah. going on in you. So yeah. what what is the burnout thing? So where are you relating to that right now? Or is that something you faced before? Something I faced before. So like, you okay. can see it. I have scars on my face from mm -hmm. uh, I had shingles at the age of 33. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I had chicken pox before. Oh. So every medical professional I saw was like, this doesn't happen. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. No, this doesn't happen. This happens to people uh, in poor health in their in their like late years, like 70, mm. 80, right? And that was that was uh, okay. Because I'm someone, I'm entrepreneurial. I hustle pretty hard, uh, yeah. and I was at that point. And I've always been someone that tries to walk that edge. Like I can yeah. work, I can work another hour, I can, and I'll steal that hour from sleep. And, totally. You know, when I work out, I work out hard. Right. My body will adapt is what my, is my thinking. <laughs> my body will adapt to this at this level of sleep, like five hours. And I do cross. Yeah, I do just a lot figure it out, right? Who cares, yeah. man? Yeah, the body will yeah. figure it out, you know. And whatever, man. I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and similar to like you're building your business, I didn't have much guidance, right? <laughs> like I was eating whatever I was eating, likely definitely not enough calories to support uh, the work I was working out I was doing, the amount of hustling I was doing for, to build the business up and uh and the limited amount of sleep i was getting 
and the amount of stress I was getting as well because I was in the middle of divorcing. Uh, wow. In the middle of a marital breakdown. And... That's, a, that's one of the biggest stresses that you can ever face. Yeah. So, and so some of the biggest stressors to ever happen in life are marital breakdown, moving, right? Yeah. You know, like, you know, you know, yeah. you know, your clients go through it, moving homes, starting yeah. new business. Hmm. And on top of that, just more gasoline, doing CrossFit four or five <laughs> times a week. And, and I, the way I operate is like back then is I, my workout's not over. Like the, I end up my finish the workout on my back on the floor in a puddle of sweat. So that's yeah, how, I, so that's it's how like hard I push. The same energy of like, it's number one or it's not worth it. It's if, if you're not, if you're not at that level, it's not worth it. That's, that's a hard, that's a really high pressure way to live. Yeah. Yeah. I wasn't going for number one cause I was nowhere near that. Yeah. But at least no, I give it my I mean, all. No, you go to your max, go to yeah. your max every yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. walking that fine edge. And then that's yeah. how, that's how I crashed. Uh, wow. the body was giving up. Uh, I had shingles, at least I thank goodness. I caught it early. Mm. Uh, I showed it to my, to my dad, actually. I said, uh, uh, I have some weird eczema that's going on. It's like going on all along my face and along my uh -huh. scalp and it's really painful. And like, he's like, that ain't, that ain't eczema, that ain't eczema. <laughs> you <Wow. have> shingles. <laughs> so I was on medication quickly. So I was, and then my eyes swole up. I could, both eyes swelled up. So I could barely see. I could barely uh, watch television. Like I couldn't work. I just laid on the couch for like three days, whatever mm. like that. But yeah, body gave up. That was burnout. And uh, yeah. And how was your how was your recovery from burnout? Uh, got me onto this journey of understanding myself better. Uh, beautiful. That's the beautiful side of it. And that's what it is for someone who pushes limits. Uh, cause I've always pushed limits. I've done, yep. I've done lots of stupid shit. You know, I still do eh, <laughs> calculated risks. Right? I do jujitsu for example. <laughs> I like how you say that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, you know, in jujitsu, like I tap because someone's about to break my arm or I'm about to be choked out. I'm going to pass out yeah. from lack of oxygen to my brain. Right. So I do shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm always, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I'm always interested in what my limits are. Yeah. And so I found yeah. that limit and now I'm on this path to fixing it all. Uh, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So with burnout, the one thing I think, like I do coaching, right? With a bunch mm -hmm. of people. And it's like, there's one guy in particular that actually drove the question. I won't, I will not say his name, but he's, um, I've told him to take one day off a week to work on his business and he won't do it. He won't do it. And it's so frustrating. And I'm like, so I don't get frustrated at him. I'm just thinking, what is this driving that? Why can't you just say no to making tons of money? And it's, why can't you say no to four people? Mm -hmm. Four people that you're going to meet with and do your job. It's outside of real estate. It's a, it's a, it's a different, it's a company. And, and I'm going, why, why don't why you? And so now after a while, now he calls and he's breaking down and his, his marriage is challenging. And it's like all these things. He's yelling at his kids. I'm like, dude, one day I asked you to do one day off because I seen it coming. A burnout in my opinion is once you're there, you don't turn around in two days. I think at the cost, this is what I say, take a holiday for 10 days or burn out for two months because you can't get back in the game. At that level, you're talking F1 race car, dude. Mm -hmm. You're at F1 race car, full speed, you've missed mm -hmm. the pit stop three times. If you would just freaking take that pit stop, you get new tires, you won't have a big accident. Yeah. And the accidents are, are what causes the problems. Now he's making decisions under burnout and his decisions are thinking of selling the company and he told me the deal he was gonna give. I had to say, I'm like, dude, you are absolutely crazy. Your company's 10 times more value. Well, I'm just not an operator. Well, then find an assistant. Why haven't you hired an assistant? Let's do that. Like, mm -hmm. and I'm trying, but I'm speaking to a man that has this massive filter of like lack of confidence all of a sudden. It just, it's just a complete wearing on him. And this is where my question did come from. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I'm watching this guy burn out. I'm going, and I'm in, dude, I've been there and I've been burnt out. And it's like, and I, I still go hard. And I, and like, I, I know my limits as much as I, I do. And I still push still. Like, it's kind of like, I just think, oh, I could do it. I could fucking do this. And I can. So there's this weird, like, you got to, consciously it's almost like you're eating a steak and you left a couple pieces on there isn't that a good analogy you just made that up that's a good one yeah because who wants to leave that or it's like you got a bowl of ice cream and you got to leave a couple bites at the end that's why i don't like that's why i go so hard because there's a couple more bites in there i'm i'm doing it yeah. but burnout is saying i'm done and you know there's a couple more deals there's a couple more business mm -hmm. you just take a step back right and you go on a holiday Go sit, if you're not doing six weeks of the year in some level of holiday, 
I think that you are going to be at a burnt out and you won't even know because your burnt out level and a never, another guy's burnt out level could be different. Mm -hmm. But what it, effects are so long term, they're hard to recover from. Mm -hmm. I think if we could understand that logically, we would actually go away and we'd be way more performance in the mm -hmm. long run. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? That's kind of just where my question came from. Mm -hmm. And to answer your question around like recovery, like I still think I'm recovering. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, like that level of stress and and what I was doing to my body did a number on my like my digestive system. Wow. So that's why that's I'm amazing. on this path of fasting the way I do because I'm, I need to give my system time to recover from yeah. the like I never ate that badly either, but uh, mm -hmm. but the stress, hey, probably the stress and the lack of sleep. So sleep is recovery, right? Sleep is recovery. You don't sleep enough. Yeah, and you don't, you, and enough. you don't get the right chemicals released. And during the time of not sleeping, there's a there's a chemical that is de-stressing chemicals. Chemicals mm -hmm. are actually happening. So we live on what is that? Uh, cortisol? No. Cortisol. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, cortisol is the hormone that's released. I think that's what it is. So I've actually shared before with my listeners yeah. or a um, long time ago. I, I had my cortisol test levels tested. So it's just a spit test. You do it four yeah. times in a day when you get up. I think noon, at mid afternoon, and before you go to bed. And I was like almost flatline. Wow. I wasn't able to produce cortisol because my body was Jeez. exhausted. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, and so how did your doctor out? say, how did your doctor say, uh -huh. Hey, this is what you need to do to get that chemical kicking again. Was it a medication? Uh, yeah, I was on not really quite medication. It was, um, uh, uh, I was on, uh, is I was trying to repair my adrenal glands. Yeah, wow. Right? But then you can't just take stuff. You need to chill out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You need, you need, yeah, you need to chill the F out. You need to... So how much was your burnout tied to your um, mental pressure versus the physical pressure? I don't... You know, I think it's all played together. Because you know how it is. Together. It's never just one thing, right? Like yeah. when you make a sale, it's never just one thing that may got you that sale, right? No different than yeah. your, your health and your condition. It's, it's, it was piling on everything, right? Wait, yeah. like four things going on, right? Marriage, new, moving to a new home, starting a business, uh, physical exhaustion, right? Lack just of sleep. nailed everything. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, yeah. You're just, you're just every, check, 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 check everything. Right. Yeah. And naturally I'm a, I'm a high stress person as well. Mm -hmm. so that's also number six right yeah. <laughs> but yeah i still consider myself on this journey to uh of understanding my limits and and also uh i'm on this try i'm i call it a path to because i don't have a better name for it a path to like optimal health yeah right trying to just trying to get my health the best it can be so i have good energy yeah. levels to because uh, we were talking before I think I don't know if we were recording or not, but like but sleep and because uh, yeah. my feeling is I need enough sleep so that I'm good to be around for like my family. Because if I don't yeah. sleep enough, I'm I'm a, I'm an ass. I'm not. I'm, I'm a crazy. bit of an ass too when I don't sleep. Like that's that's yeah. my reaction too. I can yeah. really relate. And you look and you and really that's not you. You know what I mean? Like it's almost like oh, like well, oh geez, like why the um, fuck are you get? Come on, get out. Oh, what am I doing? Yeah. And, yeah. and sleep is where that yeah. for me I'm, I'm completely night and day yeah. so that's where self-care and if you truly love your family you sleep that's where yeah. you challenge yourself yeah like if you really love them you'll go to bed yeah but like you said though so many people are like i'm doing this for them that's what i've said I, for years and it's true but it's not yeah. that's the it's it's more it's murky mm -hmm. you can't tell me i wasn't doing it for my family but you can but i can tell you there was a lot of selfish ambition and my story was still being recreated i was servicing my insecurities i was trying to make someone happier whatever mm -hmm. the driving force was it wasn't just it was a mix mm -hmm. there's goodness in there because i'm a good dude mm -hmm. but it's mixed and, and it's it's right like it's we do it for our family it's a great story yeah. but it might just be a story yeah but then like what yeah you say you and then you think you did those things for them. And then when you lose them, when you lose the family. And they say, the that's not what we wanted. And you're going, what are you talking about? Yeah. That's not what we wanted. I'm like, are you kidding me? It's like, we just have, we don't know each other's language mm -hmm. half the time. Mm -hmm. and, and, but it, what we really. And people just need to be honest. Like, is that what you want? Because I, I brought up Elon Musk many times. Like he's div divorced at least twice, three kids. Mm -hmm. There's no way he can see them enough considering his work schedule. Right. Yeah. But like, at least be honest with yourself. This is what you want, right? You are doing this for yourself, and you are okay with the yeah, outcome. Just, yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah, it's don't 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 say you're a good father if you're not. I'm not the best father. I just uh, it, just be real, you know. Yeah. That's when you can actually heal, and that's when you can actually grow. 
But the question I ask, I ask my wife today, and we do this on an ongoing basis, I asked her, we really, lately it's just been amazing. It's been a, such an awesome relationship. And uh, it hasn't been the easiest, but it's, it's now starting to really jive. And I said, Renee, am I giving you everything emotionally, physically, uh, mentally, a life that really serves what you need? And she says, no, it was today. And I said, well, I said, and I said, if you ask me the same question, I'd probably say the same thing. I'm not getting what I need out of a relationship from you. Mm -hmm. What a fucking cool conversation. Mm -hmm. It's like, so now we can have this conversation about, okay, what is that that you need? Where's it? But it's not like, I'm not getting it and you're not. Like, it's not, it's so cool to be proactive and just ask the question. Where am I not? Like, is it, is, where am I not, uh, you know, meeting your needs? And then we can have a conversation around it. And maybe she's just got her own filter. Maybe if she just doesn't know how to receive love or whatever the thing is, it's mm -hmm. not just, it's, oh, I'm not meeting her needs. It may yeah, be yeah. true, may not. Yeah. perspective but conversations to have conversations like that is like that is that real honest conversation that we avoided i had two honest conversations today that were uncomfortable but that's the depth that's how you get real that's how you get that relationship locked in it's like cementing it mm -hmm. that it's uncomfortable sometimes yeah it's continuous growth right yeah you're, yeah you're, you don't ever stop no one has a perfect relationship marriage no such thing no such thing, no such thing. Nope. I think it's two people that love each other that are willing to do whatever it takes to make it work good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone that's not willing to do whatever. And then the other side work. of it, and the other side of it is, I think everybody's pretty messed up. <laughs> There's no yeah, such thing as normal. No 100%. one's average. No one's normal. We're all a little no bit, we're all kind of weird. Totally. totally. Right. That everyone's got the quirks. Eventually, yeah. we'll find stuff that we like about each other. That's a hard yeah. part in relationship. Yeah. Eventually, it's like oh, I like natural. this guy. And that's if why you get through that point and yeah. let each other be who they're supposed to be, mm -hmm. like just let you be that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. really? Let me be that way? Well, maybe I like you again then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. And then practicing gratitude. Like people, if you go down that path of just negativity, they're picking apart what's wrong with your partner. You forget oh. about like why you fell in love in the first place. And... The only reason people pick apart their partner is because they're picking apart themselves. That's yeah. all. Yeah. If you want to stop picking, if you want relationship advice, stop picking on yourself. Yeah. You'll stop picking on your partner. Start you know, accepting who who you really are, and you'll start expecting accepting who they really are. And it'll be help if you are fully rested. <laughs> and absolutely, the practical is go to freaking bed. Yeah, yeah. Don't start having deadly conversations when you're not on your game. Time it right. Go have some fun first. Go freaking go karting. Go do a hike. Do something, and then have a real conversation. Psychologically, there's all kinds of studies and science on how to let go of things that we hold on to. Is you do an emotional, do a lot of fun, raise the energy, go compete in a soccer match, and then sit down and say, "Here's where I'm at." Mm -hmm. So very tactical is you open up that energy flow where you're having a blast. Go do something. Go hiking. Do something. Mm -hmm. Then have the if you really want to give best odds yeah, just give me an idea I should book a date night just think maybe maybe laser quest with the wife <laughs> yeah then if you can have some intentional conversation after it then it's cool you bring some depth to it right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah my relationship is a little bit a little bit funny because she's like she really is like my business partner my wife's an accountant she's a pretty successful one and she's my investing yeah. partner like we we are true like our business is really like 50 50 so we talk a yeah. lot of business <laughs> yeah. well, it's just which is okay too right but if you bring in a real raw question it'll bring some depth because mm -hmm. when shit hits the fan dude your business conversations don't hold it together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why not be proactive no. and talk about the hard shit now when you're doing good mm -hmm. like we just wait then that have fun when you're pissed off and shit and financial and all kinds of problems and then have that talk have fun that's mm -hmm. tough but want to be proactive on it all right, Ben, I've taken, holy crap, it's almost six o'clock. <laughs> six o'clock my time. So for the listeners <laughs> the listeners who don't know, we had a whole bunch of technical difficulties before we actually got on. So we, Ben and I have been talking for like at least half an hour before we even started recording. <laughs> <laughs> cussing and swearing at my computer, but it, and it didn't work. I had to get a new computer, so. <laughs> ben ran out and bought a new computer just for the yeah. show so that you guys, could, you guys could hear this story, so. From Costco, because then you can return it, right? No. <laughs> no. My assistant went home early and I ended up taking it. So that's how we worked it out. But anyways, yeah, we've been on for a bit. So Ben, I want to say thank you. This has been very enjoyable for me and I hopefully for my listeners as well. It's not where we, th eh, you know, it's not where I thought we'd end up, but it's pretty much every episode is pretty much not where I thought we'd go. Uh, I want to thank you for this. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed your time on the show. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.